Typhoid Fever by Hyla Torres. Today we will learn all about typhoid fever. What is it? How can it be contracted? Is it preventable? We will cover all of that and more, including reviewing a historical account of an infamous woman nicknamed Typhoid Mary. What is typhoid fever? Typhoid fever, also known as Salmonella enterica enterica, is a bacterial disease found in humans and is caused by the Salmonella serotype typhi. The root word we see here, enteric, refers to the collective term formed from both forms of the fever, typhoid and paratyphoid fever. Although they are similar in relation, today we will focus on typhoid fever only. The Salmonella genus that is in the taxonomy of typhoid fever is not the typical kind you see in the United States today. They are completely different. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, also known as the CDC, have estimated that there is between 11 to 21 million cases of typhoid fever annually. There is a large gap due to the nature of cases going unreported. About 1% of this 21 million will die as a result of the disease. As for the scientific classification and taxonomy of typhoid fever, we see the domain as bacteria, the phylum as proteobacteria, our class is gamma proteobacteria, the order enterobacterials, the family enterobacteriae, the genus Salmonella, species S. enterica, as mentioned, and subspecies, which was also mentioned as S. e. enterica. In order to fully understand the disease, it's vital to know its structure. This helps scientists know how to create vaccines and other ways of preventing it from spreading through a population. Typhoid fever toxins are similar to those of pertussis toxin, as they both are considered AB toxins, which simply means they consist of a single type of A subunit and a B subunit with small variances. The way that typhoid differs from pertussis is that it can contain up to two types of the subunits. Visually, the structure displays with a pyramid shape and adheres to the surface glycans. Vaccines, treatments, and more. Carl Joseph Eberth, who's pictured on the right, was named the first to discover bacillus to cause typhoid fever in the year 1880. Relatively speaking, this was not that long ago. This was confirmed just four short years later by a man called George Gafke, who named the bacillus what is known today as Salmonella enterica. Almroth Edward Wright created the first vaccine against typhoid fever, and it was approved for military uses to protect the men at war. This was largely due to the fact that soldiers at this time typically died more so as a result of the typhoid fever over being killed during a war battle. Today, there are two types of the vaccine available, and the World Health Organization even recently approved a conjugate vaccine in December of 2017 that provides the person with longer lasting immunity. The conjugation of the protein carbohydrates is what makes the vaccine safe for very young children, which is great news considering the other vaccines typically worked for those who are six years and older. Because of the vaccination and years of strengthening hygienic practices, typhoid fever is now considered to be a rarity in developed countries. The good news, we have treatments available. The bad news, antibiotic resistance is alive and well, no pun intended. New antibiotics have been developed since then, but seeing as though antibiotics that were once highly effective against typhoid fever are now no longer working makes researchers of new drugs skeptical that it will kick typhoid to the curb for good. Once treated, a person with typhoid fever can still be a carrier, which we'll talk more about later, and it can indeed infect others if they're not careful. Medical professionals can test an individual who has been treated in order to determine whether or not the bacteria is still present. 
transmission. Someone who is infected with typhoid fever may easily spread the disease when they use the restroom and do not wash their hands or wash their hands improperly. This is especially true if they work in food production. Thereafter, the bacteria can now spread in anything they touch, including food, drinks, and even other objects. Uncontaminated food washed with contaminated water also can put a person at risk. Once the bacteria have spread to a new person, it has the possibility of being eliminated by stomach acid. This is true for a healthy and strong adult, but those who are children or have weaker gastric acid cannot fight it off. In this case, if the bacteria prevails, it will find its way into the lymphatic system via penetration of the gastric epithelium, then to the bloodstream, and will begin to reproduce and soon cause blood poisoning. This causes a massive inflammatory response and will implode as mentioned, leaving a hole in the stomach lining. It is characterized by its symptoms of painful abdominal cramping, nausea, headaches, disruption of common bowel movements including constipation and or diarrhea. The pathogenesis of typhoid fever can vary considerably due to the dose and how the person was infected. Typhoid can easily spread to affect other areas of the body including the spleen, the liver, and even deep into a person's bone marrow. Reentry can occur via the liver to the, to the gallbladder via the bile ducts. Once here, it goes into a large intestine and is later excreted, which may further contaminate others who come in contact. If left untreated, fatal outcomes can occur if it continues to spread. It even has the possibility of causing meningitis, which can be deadly. In current years, Typhoid fever is relatively uncommon in the United States due to current health regulations, and it's more common in other countries such as Asia, Africa, and even islander countries. This is largely due to sanitation systems. Studies have shown that an outbreak of typhoid fever in Cassis District in Africa, an area literally flooded with environmental concerns, proves high incidence rates of the disease. In the United States, we have centralized sewage, and most people follow practices such as washing hands, which helps eliminate the, case, the cases of the disease spreading. This is why it's more prevalent in other countries that may not have the same access to toilets, sewage, clean water, hand washing regulations, etc. Typhoid fever can only be spread person to person as animals cannot have the disease or carry it. The CDC recommends that if you are traveling to another country and are concerned about the risk of getting typhoid fever, the first line of defense would to be to get vaccinated with either the oral or injectable vaccine. Additionally, the traveling person can be sure to maintain proper hygienic practices and avoid consuming raw foods or bush meat. Tap water can be a risk as well as fresh squeezed juices, anything unpasteurized. Opt for food that you are sure has been cooked thoroughly. A study conducted in Cambodia, an area with high reporting of typhoid fever, proved that up to 15% of cases of the fever that have gone over a week without treatment leads to high chances of complications resulting. Some of these complications can be hepatitis, hemorrhaging, or other severe complications. Typhoid fever over the years has developed into what is called a multi-drug resistant, or MDR. This means antibiotic resistance is appearing, forcing scientists to develop new drugs for treatment. The old ones just aren't working anymore. This particular study focuses on Cambodian children, and some of the vaccines are not regulated for use in children of all ages. Some are age-specific, which makes this problematic since children are at such high risk for typhoid fever, among other diseases they are exposed to. This particular study group also worked to differentiate if these children did indeed, did indeed have typhoid fever compared to other possible diseases or complications, such as malaria. Part of the diagnosis involved invasive tests, including that of bone marrow testing. 
Not only are these tests invasive, but they also take up to a week to have results available. Other tests are available, but they lack in specificity for the disease. Cost effectiveness was also a major factor in the study, as this is a generally low income based country. For the particular model conducted, it was hypothesized that kids aged anywhere from less than a year old up to 14 years old were eligible for this tree model in a group of nearly 1,000 children. Researchers involved in the study had two possible outcomes, which are a true positive, meaning the number represented was for a correctly diagnosed case of typhoid fever, and a possible true negative. Seeing the tree model one, can conclude the number of successful or failed treatments for those in the study. There are consistencies among the true positives and the false negatives for the multi-resistant strains, as seen in the diagram on this page. Typhoid Mary and other famous historical stories of typhoid fever. There have been many historical accounts of math death due to typhoid fever. It is believed by many historians that it could have killed off nearly a third of the population in early Athens. A colony in the East Coast called Jamestown may have been nearly eliminated due to the fatal endings of the fever. Even notes from the American Civil War show signs that soldiers did not all die from dysentery, but that typhoid fever was to blame for many of those deaths. Probably the most common of all historical accounts of the disease would be the account of Typhoid Mary. If you have ever heard of typhoid fever before, chances are you may have heard of the infamous Mary Mallon. Mary was known to be an Irish immigrant worker who came to the United States in the late 1800s. This timeline falls close to the time when Carl Liebermeister discovered the microorganism. Mary was lucky to have been set up with New York's most wealthy, especially considering the impoverished background she came from. A great opportunity for a stable job in a new country. A man named Charles Henry Warren hired Mary to be a cook in his estate in Oyster Bay. Again, this is a wealthy part of New York. Of the 11 members of his family being hosted in this estate, six of them fell ill with typhoid fever. Reportedly at this time, about 3,000 people in the New York area had typhoid fever. This was still a few years before the vaccine was available to protect against the disease. And antibiotics would not be an option for at least another 30-something years. As the mystery continued of where the typhoid fever was spreading from, George Soper was hired to get to the bottom of this. And after his investigative research, he found that Mary Mallon was at the top of his list of suspects. In the research, he found seven of the eight families that she had reportedly worked for came down with typhoid fever. It was especially curious that she would leave the home she was working in when the illness struck. Was this a coincidence? Did she leave simply because little work was to be done? Or did she know what she was doing and left before she could be blamed? Soper was determined to pinpoint Mary as the carrier, but how could he if she was healthy? He had an idea that she may, maybe she was not displaying symptoms. He would still need to collect blood, stool, and urine samples from her to be sure. The largest mystery at all time was how she spread the illness, carried it, and did not display any symptoms. She claimed to be completely asymptomatic. It was a revolutionary thought that a person at this time could be a carrier and display little to no symptoms at all, especially considering just how violently ill typhoid fever's victims fell. When Soper met Mary and requested the samples, she angrily denied him and claimed it was impossible that she was a carrier. This led Soper, eventually getting authorities involved, after his efforts were fruitless to force her to share the samples. It was said that at this time she was taken to an isolation medical center on a nearby island called North Brothers. Mary would be tested for typhoid fever and quarantined here for nearly two years. As you can see on the picture of the screen, she's not very happy about it. This put some strain on her medical captors as they truly believed they were keeping New York population safe while she was put away. Yet, she was not displaying any signs or symptoms of the disease still. 
When the results were back, doctors told Mary they believed it was her gallbladder as a source of the issue and offered a bargain that if they could operate on her and surgically remove her gallbladder, they would release her. Strong-headed Mary denied them. Instead of accepting this, she pleaded with them that if they released her, she would never work in the cooking business again. She just really didn't want the surgery. They eventually agreed. However, her, prom her promise was broken about five years later when she went to work under a new name at a Manhattan maternity ward as Mary Brown. At her time there, it was recorded that 20 to 25 patients and members of the medical staff in this specific maternity ward came down with typhoid fever. When two of these 20 people were reported dead, the police brought Mary back to be quarantined in North Brothers for the rest of her life. She spent 20 years in solitary confinement and passed away from pneumonia. Upon her passing, her autopsy and medical examination proved the doctor's theory right that she did indeed have live salmonella typhi virus present in her corpse. It's interesting to think about the two perspectives here on Typhoid Mary. It's easy from the facts to see Mary as a villain, unwilling to change careers in order to save her community. She was clearly infecting. Another view comes from a surprising author and chef, Anthony Bourdain. He wrote a book about Typhoid Mary, and he shares that perhaps Soper is not the hero many believed he was. This is where science meets ethics. Soper was on a mission to deem Mary as the source of the typhoid outbreaks in Oyster Bay. Though this is true, he stirs up thoughts about looking down on immigrants and their unsanitary methods. It didn't make anything easy on her. And he did not make any efforts whatsoever to educate Mary on how and why she was spreading typhoid fever, which is important to keep in mind in an educator's perspective. It was still rare in that time for hygienic practices that take place today to be used, and Mary knew little about what she could have done to protect the families she worked for. She found herself going back to what she knew best, cooking, just in order to maintain a living. With that being said, it's easy to look at the facts at hand. Considering the story alone dates back to almost 150 years ago, science has come a long way to identify what typhoid fever is, how to prevent it, and even coming up with vaccines against it. This is true for many diseases, and it is exactly why it is important to learn from history to gain new perspectives on how the disease affects our views on public health and the almost invisible world of microbiology. Thank you.